Welcome to Next Steps. My name is Gabe, and I'm the pastor of Impact Church. My name's Amanda, and I'm his wife. We have two girls, two boys, and we just want to take a little bit of time to share with you our story today. Yeah, I remember back in 2014 when we first started feeling like the Lord was putting it on our heart to step out in faith and plant this church that is now called Impact Church. And uh, just the the fear that came yeah. with that, the uh, dream that came with that, you know, it was kind of this excitement, but uh, a little nervous at the same time. And so we moved to Paris, Texas in 2016 at the beginning of the year. And we just started meeting people. Uh, we had interest hangouts is what we called them. And we gathered as many people as we could together just to be able to share kind of what God had put on our heart to do and what the church, yeah, we served all in the community before we ever even met together as a church. And we just wanted to love on people, meet people, um, just gather people around this idea of a life-giving church that uh, could be a blessing in their lives and what God wanted to do through the dream and the vision that he had put on our heart. And so uh, all of that led up to launch team meetings and about 25 people that uh, had gathered together and said, basically, let's do this. Let's launch this church. And I remember on September the 18th of 2016 was the, the first Sunday that we gathered together as a church. And I remember thinking, and we were talking, and I remember sharing with you that uh, just the thought of, is anybody coming? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, we've, we've done all of this preparation, and we believe this is what God told us to do, and is anybody going to show up? And on that day, it was incredible because about 160 people showed up on the first Sunday, and really the rest is history. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just, we're so thankful that you have taken time to be a part of Next Steps, what we call Next Steps. And what our goal is in this is we want to be able to share the vision, mm -hmm. the mission with you, mm -hmm. um, our government structure, and just let you in on some information so that uh, as you begin to serve, as you begin to get connected, uh, you'll know exactly what you're connecting to and what our church is all about. So we're just thankful that you're here. Yeah. And uh, we look forward to being able to share this information with you. We hope it's a blessing to you. And uh, here we go. So the first thing that we are going to talk about is our mission as a church. And two statements really that we want you to be familiar with as a person that is desiring to call Impact Church your home church. Our vision statement is simply this, that we exist to see people transformed by Jesus. The heart of our church is that we want to see you, we want to see every person that walks in these doors, and even people in our community, we want to see every person transformed by Jesus, which then leads to the question, how are we going to accomplish that? What are the systems, what are the things that we have put in place as a church to help us accomplish the goal of seeing people transformed in their lives in every way by Jesus? And so what is success? What is the mission? What is it that God desires for his people? And we believe that God desires three things for his people. It's to see lost people saved, to see saved people discipled, and discipled people mobilized. And so what we're trying to accomplish as a church is to see every person go from being lost to being saved, to know, know God personally, once they're saved, to see that person discipled and then discipled people mobilized and living this out in their lives. And so we say that really, we break it down into just three words that hopefully are easy for you to remember when you're wondering about the vision and the mission of our church. And we want every person to do three things. We want you to know, grow, and go. We want every person to know, grow, and and go. God desires for every person to know Him personally, grow in their faith, and be discipled, and to go into the world and repeat this in their own lives. And so as a church, at Impact Church, we want to lead people to do just that, to know God personally, to grow deep in their faith, and to go make an impact in the world. So the first thing we're going to talk about today and that I want to uh, teach you and explain to you is on the word no. It's seeing lost people saved. And with each one of these areas of our vision and mission, 
uh, we're really going to be answering three questions together that help us understand that this is God's heart for the church, that this is God's heart for every person. Uh, what we're doing as a church to try to see that take place and then how you can be involved in that part of the mission. And so the first question is this, how do we know that God's desire is for every person to know him personally? And I want us to look at just a few scriptures from the word of God that show us really how much lost people matter to God. And so we're going to begin today in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, where the Bible says this, it says, Dear friends, don't overlook this one fact. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord does not delay His promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 this is good and it pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Matthew chapter 18 verses 12 through 14 says, What do you think? If someone has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, won't he leave the ninety-nine on the hillside and go and search for the stray? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he rejoices over that sheep more than over the ninety-nine that did not go astray. In the same way, it is not the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones perish. In Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 1, it says, All the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him, and the Pharisees and scribes were complaining, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable, talking about Jesus. Jesus tells them this story, this parable. He says, What man among you? who has a hundred sheep and loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open field and go after the one until he finds it. When he has found it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders, and coming home, he calls his friends and neighbors together, saying to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous people who don't need repentance." Or what woman who has ten silver coins, if she loses one, does not delight, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found the silver coin I lost. I tell you, in the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. He also said, A man who a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of my estate I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country and he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who had sent him into his fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food, and here I am dying of hunger. I'll get up, go to my father, and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. It's no long, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. So he got up and went to his father. But while his son while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran through his arms around his neck and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it. And let's celebrate with a feast because this son of mine was dead and is alive Again, he was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. And then in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, it says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. All throughout Scripture and in the things that Jesus taught, we see him communicate over and over again that he cares about lost People That lost people matter to God. And if lost people matter to God, then lost people should matter to us as a church. And so we can see clearly in Scripture that lost people matter to God, that it's God's desire for every person to know Him personally. And here's the second question. It's what systems do we have in place as a church 
to accomplish this part of our mission? What is it that we have in place that is specifically directed toward accomplishing this part of our mission? I believe the first thing out of two uh, that we have specifically designated to try to accomplish this is Sunday services. Uh, Our desire as a church is to create a place on Sundays where Jesus is celebrated, Christians can be equipped and grow in their faith, grow in their knowledge, and where unbelievers can also encounter Jesus and give their life to Him. We want to structure our services in a way that every believer, every person that has been serving the Lord for 50 years, 10 years, one year, six months, can grow in their faith, grow in their knowledge of the truth, but at the same time, those that are maybe sitting in a service on Sunday can experience God in a real way and give their life to Him. The second thing we believe is personal evangelism. It's the call of, of, of God on my life and on your life personally to share the good news of Jesus. It's that you and I are called individually to spread the good news of Jesus to everyone, to see people saved, to see lost people come to faith in Christ. We believe that your home is a mission field, that your job is a mission field, that your neighbors are a mission field, that every person in your sphere of influence, they are a mission field. If they are lost, if they are far from God, that God has called you, God has called me individually to evangelize, to share the good news, to share our story and our testimony with them so that we can see lost people saved in our lives. And then the third question is, how can you be a part of this mission? If we know that that this matters to God, seeing lost people saved, it matters to God. We know that there are systems in place and ways that we're trying to accomplish this. The, The third question is, how can you be a part? How can you jump on board in this way to see lost people saved? The first thing is maybe uh, maybe salvation is the next step for you. Maybe you're even sitting in this room or in this, this facility or in this place right now, and you're watching this video, and you know that maybe you don't know God personally. And so I believe that salvation could be the first step for you. If you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, then it's the first and most important step. And just looking at a few scriptures to kind of break this down for you, starting in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 20 through verse 25, For no one will be justified in his sight by the works of the law, because the knowledge of sin comes through the law. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed, attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, since there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented Him as the mercy seat by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. In John 3.16 that many of us are so familiar with, says, For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Here's what we need to understand. We were all sinners. Every one of us were in need of a Savior. And Jesus came and he paid the price for you and I so that we could know God personally, so that we could come to the Father through what he did on his death, burial, and resurrection it's, it's the most important decision that you can make in your life is to give your life to Jesus, to surrender everything to Him, to know Him personally. And if you've never taken this step and received forgiveness and salvation 
then I want to lead you in this prayer, even right here as we sit in this room. And I believe that if you pray this prayer, you mean this in your heart, that if you surrender your life, if you confess Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, that even today, right now, where you sit, that He is going to save you. And so just pray this prayer with me. Jesus, thank you for giving your life for me, for living a perfect life, for laying your life down, for dying on the cross for my sins and for being raised from the dead on the third day so that I could have life. Today, I believe in my heart that you are the Son of God. I confess with my mouth and I declare you as Lord of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer even right now in this room, I believe that that you are now a child of the Most High God, that you are a child of God. And we just want to congratulate you and, and just say, hey, let somebody know. Tell the person that's facilitating this class that you made that decision today so that we can resource you, you, we can get some things in your hands that will help you as you begin your journey with Jesus. And if you just received the Lord for the first time and you've never been water baptized, we want to encourage you to to be water baptized. We have periodically throughout the year weekends that we call May New Weekend where it is set aside specifically to, to see people water baptized. Those that have given their life to Jesus, they've confessed Him as Lord and Savior of their life and they're declaring publicly that the old is gone and the new has come. And so you can go on our website, click on the baptism tab, And you can find out the next date that is available for you to be baptized. And you can sign up to be water baptized. We would encourage you to do that. And we just want to say thank you again so much for allowing us the opportunity to pour into you. And and congratulations if you made that decision. And we believe that we're called to, to, to go out and to see people in our lives through personal evangelism. We're called to go out and share our testimony. Share what Jesus has done for us with other people to see lost people. Say. All right. So the second word that we uh, use to describe our mission and our vision as a church is the word grow. And it's this idea of seeing saved people discipled. It's those that have come to faith in Christ, they've given their life over to Jesus. They are saved, but now it's a discipleship process that God wants to take them on and that we want to try to take every individual on as a believer. And so the first question again is, how do we know that God's desire is for every person to be discipled? How do we know that God desires for every person to grow in their faith? And we want to look again at a few scriptures that I believe clearly let us know that it's God's desire for this to take place in our lives. Beginning in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, it says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Then we will no longer be little children, tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness in the techniques of deceit. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into Him who is the head, Christ. In Hebrews chapter 5, starting in verse 12, Although by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the basic principles of God's revelation again. You need milk, not solid food. Now everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the message about righteousness because he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and and evil. In Colossians chapter 2 verses 6 and 7 it says, "So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus our Lord, continue to walk in him. Be rooted and built up in him and established in the faith just as you were taught and overflowing with gratitude." And so we clearly see in just a few verses from God's word that God desires for every person not to just know him, But once we know Him, to be discipled and to grow in our faith, to grow in our relationship with Him. If discipleship matters to God, then discipleship 
should matter to us as a church. And so the second question, once again, is what systems do we have in place as a church to accomplish this part of our mission? What do we, what avenues, what are the strategic things that we have set in place as a church to help people grow in their faith, to help people be discipled? The first one is grow groups. And it's a big one. We talk a lot in our church about what we call grow groups. And as a church, our primary way that we are seeking to disciple people and to raise up others who can disciple people is through grow groups. And there's a verse in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17. It says, iron sharpens iron and one person sharpens another. And I want to read this same verse from the Amplified Bible because I love the way that it words it. It says it this way, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens and influences another through discussion, through discussion. In grow groups, these are curriculum-based things. These are Bible-based gatherings of 10 to 15 to 20 people throughout the week to where we are discussing, we are growing in God's Word, we are growing in our knowledge of the truth, we are growing in our faith, we are being discipled. The second area and and way that we believe we are trying to accomplish this part of our mission to see every person grow in their faith is through a personal quiet time. It's you as an individual having a time every single day that is just set aside for you, quiet time with the Lord. Are you making room in your life to worship? Are you making room in your life to pray? I didn't say, are you finding room? Are you making time? Are you making room in your life to worship and to pray and to read God's word throughout the week on your own time? We believe it's so important for you to be making time personally to spend time with the Lord, to be worshiping, to be praying, to be reading God's word and studying it so that you can continue to grow every single day. And the third question is this, how can you be a part of our vision? If we believe in this so much, then you need to know how you can get on board in this area of growing in your faith. And so it's very simply, uh, the first one is to join a group. Join a group. You can go on our website, yourimpactchurch.com, and you can click on the Grow Groups tab, and you can find out what semester of groups we're in, what groups are available, when the next semester begins. All of these details, all of these things are on the website or on the Church Center app. And you can find out these details for yourself so that you can join a group. This is how we sharpen each other and grow as believers. Our grow groups, they gather in three semesters per year. There's one in the spring, one in the summer, and one in the fall. And once again, go on the website. Find out all the details that you need to know so that you and your family can get in a group. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 24, or chapter 10, excuse me, verses 24 and 25 says, and let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. The second way that you can get on mission with us, uh, with you and your family in your personal life is to have a personal quiet time. We just talked about this a few minutes ago, but it's so important for you to have a personal quiet time. Maybe you need to set an alarm. Maybe you need to set a reminder. Maybe you need to do something practical that will help you remember and form the habit of having a personal quiet time with the Lord daily. We believe it's so important for us to have a growing relationship with the Lord. So the third part of our mission, our vision, is that uh, we all need to go. Not only do we need to know and not only do we need to grow, but we also need to go. We need to see discipled people mobilized. Not, Not growing in our knowledge and growing in our faith just for ourselves, but so that we can go out and see other people come to know Jesus. We can go out and we can lead other people to be discipled in our own personal lives. And so once again, the question is, how do we know that God's desire is for every person to go? And we're going to look at some scripture again, as we've done with the first two parts of our vision and mission. We're going to begin in Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. 
It says, Then he said to them, talking about Jesus, he said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. We see in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. We also see in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so Jesus' command is clearly for us to go, for us to preach the gospel, for us to make disciples, for us to see people baptized, for us to be his witnesses in all the world. So not only do we need to know God personally and grow in our faith, be discipled, but all of that is so we can go out into our part of the world or into the world as a whole, which we're going to talk about in just a moment, some ways that you can do that. And we can see others come to faith in Christ. We can see others be discipled and experience the love of God the way that we have as well. If mobilizing our faith matters to God, then mobilizing our faith should matter to us as a church. And so the second question, again, under this part of our vision and mission is what systems do we have in place as a church to accomplish this part of the mission? What do we have strategically set in place so that we can accomplish this idea of going and seeing discipled people mobilized. The first one that I want to talk to you about is outreach and serving. We love outreach and serving as a church. Each month we have a first Saturday serve day where we go into our local community and we serve. And there are other opportunities even throughout the year uh, in addition to that, where we go out and we love on people in our community, we reach outside of the four walls, reach outside, and we go and we serve and love people. Here's what the Bible says in Matthew 25, starting in verse 35. It says, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or without clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. In James chapter 1 and verse 27 it says, pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. And then in James chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, if a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, stay warm, and be well fed, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? In other words, we are called to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to serve and to reach out to others around us. We believe as a church that serving and reaching out in our community is going to be a vital part of what we do and how we go. The second way is through mission trips. And each year we organize and go on a short-term mission trip, which is about seven days long. Uh, and it's a way that we go into another country, another part of the world to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to do projects and love on people and share the gospel with those that are there in that part of the world. Another way would be to give to missions, giving to missions. Each year we set aside a minimum of 10% of our yearly budget as a church to be given away in the area of missions, to be given away locally, to be given away nationally, and to be given away internationally. And this is your giving that is going into the world. This is your giving that is going into our community. This is your giving that is going into our country. This is your giving that is going into other parts of the world to see people come to know Jesus and to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Another way would be to lead a grow group. And our prayer is that through discipleship in grow groups, 
that others within those groups would then step out to lead a group maybe the next semester to take people alongside them to disciple others. That there would be this multiplication process that as we are discipled in groups, we would step out to lead others and disciple others in groups. And then the last way that, that we believe that is strategic, strategically in place as a church for us to accomplish this idea of going and, and seeing our faith mobilized is our own person, personal mission field. It's your home. It's your workplace. It's your family and your friends and your sphere of influence and all of these areas that are all personal mission fields where you are called to go into the world in that way, to go into your workplace, to go into your family, to go into your community and be the hands and feet of Jesus, to see your faith and disciples mobilized. The things that God has done in your life for it to be mobilized so that others can come to faith in Jesus, so that others can be discipled as well. And then the third question is this, how can you be a part of this vision? How can you be a part of this part of our mission as a church? What are some practical things that you can do? And we've just talked about the ways that we are strategically trying to accomplish this, that we are setting out to do these things. And so I believe it's that you can serve on a team, that you can be a part of outreach, that you can go on a mission trip one summer or one year, that you can give to missions financially, that you can lead a grow group, that you can look for opportunities to share the gospel in your own personal life. So I want to sum all of this part of this teaching up in this way. Um, Jesus' call to his disciples, I believe, you won't find this terminology necessarily in the Bible, but if we could paraphrase it, this is what I believe Jesus would say. Uh, he would say, give your life to me, follow me, learn from me, and then go and do the same for others. Give your life to me, surrender your life to me, follow me, let me teach you, learn from me, and then go and do the same for other people. God's desire for your life and the lives of the people that you know is for every person to know him personally, to grow deep in faith, and to go impact the world. And so here's the final question regarding our vision, regarding our mission, and it's simply this, and I want to ask you this today. Are you ready to live your life on mission? The next portion that I want to talk to you about that um, I believe and we believe as a church is very important for you to know is our government structure. It's how we're structured as a church. And so our, our church government is made up of two groups, and then there is a network of churches that we are affiliated with. And so I want to talk to you about that and try to explain that to you so that you can know how we're structured as a church. The first thing, the first group uh, of individuals is that we are guided by elders, what we call elders. And this group oversees the day-to-day -day ministry and operations of the church. They serve the congregation and are responsible for the development of the spiritual life of the church. They oversee the, the finances and provide counsel to uh, the pastor, which would be myself, regarding the major, major financial commitments of the church. And so these are the men within our church that are gathering together, meeting together uh, on a monthly basis, looking over uh, the budget, looking over the different things like that, and really helping us as a church to to be guided in the right direction, to be led in the right direction, to have accountability in all of these things. And so we are guided by elders. And in the packet that you received when you came in today, there should be a list there of the current elders uh, that are on our board of elders right now. And so you can see those names and you can become familiar with those names and those individuals that are helping to lead our church in this way. The second area or the second group is that we are strengthened by overseers. And so not only do we have elders within our body, within our church, uh, we also have overseers. And the overseers are pastors and or ministry leaders of respected congregations and ministries who love Impact Church and are willing and are willing to provide spiritual protection to the church. And they may be called upon to help in accountability matters relating to the pastor if requested to do so by the elders. And so these are individuals that are outside of our church 
but love Impact Church, that are familiar with Impact Church, that you have probably seen at some point on a Sunday or will see at some point on a Sunday coming in to speak and pour into our church. But they are individuals that love our church and are providing accountability from the outside. And so they're people that we can bring in if necessary for accountability matters or uh, to settle different things within our church if we needed to. And then the last thing I want to talk to you about as in regards to uh, our government structure and how we're structured is our affiliation. It's Impact Church is a member of the Association of Related Churches, or ARC, A-R-C for short. ARC is an organization that provides ministry training. They provide resources. Uh, they provide conferences, relationships, and a whole lot more to almost a thousand churches. And so we're a part of a network of churches uh, where Amanda and myself and other leaders at times, we can be resourced. Uh, there are yearly conferences that we can go to to grow and be in relationship with other pastors. There are local things that we're able to be a part of because of that. There are trainings that we can go to. There is relationship there uh, with our church and other churches so that we are uh, not doing this thing alone, but we're a part of a network of churches that are, are bringing life to people and, uh, and moving the gospel forward. And so we just wanted you to know how we're structured, that we are guided by elders, that we are strengthened by overseers, and that we are a part of a network of churches um, that is the Association of Related Churches, or ARC for short. Uh, so if you have any questions about that, you can find more information on our website, yourimpactchurch.com, or the person that is facilitating this class may be able to answer any questions that you might have as well. The next thing I want to talk to you about is our financial accountability. It's how we steward church finances. So your giving, uh, the giving of those around you, every person that gives financially to this ministry and to Impact Church. And as a church, we operate each year based on a budget of 90% of the previous year's income. And so when the elders set the budget for the next calendar year, we are setting that budget based on 90% of what the total giving was for the previous year. For example, if the total giving for this year that we are in was $100,000, then we would budget to spend $90,000 the next year, which leaves us with 10% margin every year, which is great opportunity, great stewardship, but also opportunity if God presents uh, an opportunity that we need to seize in the moment that we have uh, some finances set aside through good stewardship to where we're able to uh, be a part and, and take part in that and jump into what it is that God wants us to do. Um, our current budget structure is based on percentages for four different categories. And so uh, we budget 90% of the previous year's income, the previous year's giving. And out of that percentage, the entire budget for that next year, we break that into four different categories where finances are spent, and we do that on a percentage basis. And so 10% of the budget is set aside for missions giving. And so this is a minimum baseline that can increase and usually does increase um, as, as giving increases throughout the year because we want to be a blessing locally. We want to be giving locally, giving nationally, and giving internationally. But we do have a 10% baseline that we will give away in the area of missions every single year. 30% of the budget is set aside for ministry within the church. And so things like outreach, youth ministry, kids ministry, benevolence ministry, worship ministry, grow groups, things like that. We have 30% of our budget set aside to be able to financially fund those areas of ministry. And so curriculum, uh, special events, trips, things that we're doing like that, that uh, that go along with our vision. We want, uh, we want to set aside 30% of every year's budget to be able to go into those things. 30% of the budget is set aside for facilities and facility-related expenses. So facilities for church services, uh, utilities for those facilities, offices, office expenses, things like that. 30% of our yearly budget is set aside for those type of things so that we can function as a church, so that we can continue to move forward as a church. And then the last of these four categories is that we set aside 30% as well 
for salaries for staff members. And so pastors, associate pastors, administration, things like that, whether it be full-time or part-time, there's a 30, there's 30% 30 of our budget that is set aside to be able to uh, to pay individuals to be a part of the ministry, to lead areas of ministry. And so those four different categories are missions, uh, ministry within the church, facilities, and then salaries. And so that is kind of how we break down uh, the total budget for the year in those percentages. And it keeps us driving within the lines, so to speak, so that we know when we can hire somebody new, when we can get into a new building, when we can do all these things. It kind of sets a guideline for us to go by. Um, our elders are the individuals who set and maintain the yearly budget for the church. And so uh, they're the ones that set it. They're the ones that uh, we, we meet together on a monthly basis and we look over the finances, we look at where the church is at financially, we look at the giving, we look at uh, what, what expenses we've had and we make sure that we're staying within the guidelines that have been set forth so that we can steward the finances properly and uh, have God's blessing on it in that way. All of our giving is processed by a company called Planning Center Giving and within that there's a company called Stripe that processes all of our online giving and text to give transactions. And so everything is categorized, everything as far as uh, tax statements for the end of the year, things like that, it's all processed through a company called Planning Center Giving. And so when you give online or when you give in check form or you give in cash form, all of that is logged in Planning Center Giving so that everything is accurate Everything can be given to you at the end of the year in a statement or any time if you needed to see, hey, what have I given so far this year? We would be able to pull that up because of this company called Planning Center Giving. Uh, this software organizes and tracks each person's giving and provides year-end statements for tax purposes. And then also our financial income statements and our expense tracking and our financial reports are done by a company called Aplos. And so they track and categorize all of the giving they manage all of our expenses, they manage all of the outgoing money, and they provide an income statement, they provide an expense report each month, which is reviewed by our elders. And so we're able to look and see in detail where every dollar has been spent so that we can make sure that we are stewarding well, that we are staying within the budget that was set uh, previously before we walked into that ministry year. And so those are great ways that we remain accountable, that we are able to use outside companies to manage these and provide reports and provide uh, tax statements and all of these things. And so that's just a little bit of information about how we steward finances, how we budget, and how we operate financially as a church. So the next area I want to talk to you about is servant leadership and what does it look like to serve and to lead at impact. And in Matthew chapter 20, starting in verse 25, this is what the Bible says. It says, Jesus called them over and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and those in high positions act as tyrants over them. It must not be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Leadership and service God's way looks like servant leadership. Servant leadership is being willing to place others before yourself. It's leading in a way that puts others ahead of yourself. Servant leadership is leading and serving in a way that is for the well-being of everyone else. It's, for, it's leading and serving in a way that is for the well-being of everyone else on the team, putting others before ourselves. And there are three specific character traits that we desire and strive for in every area of serving and leadership within the church, within Impact Church. This is what we believe. And to, to jump and kind of take us in this direction, I want to Look over at Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. This is what it says. It says, Darius the Mede decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces, and he appointed a high officer to rule over each province. The king also chose Daniel and two others as administrators to supervise the high officers and protect the king's interests. 
Daniel soon proved himself more capable than, than all the other administrators and high officers. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. And I want you to pay close attention to verse number four. Then the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs, but they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. When they got frustrated and they were looking for a way to bring something against Daniel, this is what they found out, that he was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. And so what does it look like to be a great servant leader? And here's point number one. We will always be faithful. What does it look like to be a servant leader at Impact Church? It looks like someone who has made the decision to always be faithful. The first character trait of a good servant leader is faithfulness. Faithfulness. Faithfulness to follow Jesus. Faithfulness to do everything to the best of their ability with excellence. Faithfulness to call to the call of God on their life. Faithfulness in the good times and faithfulness in the bad times. And the definition, a definition, great definition of the word faithful is simply this. It's strict or thorough in performance of duty, true to one's word, promises, vows, etc. Steady in allegiance or affection, loyal, constant, reliable, trusted, or believed, adhering or true to fact, a standard or an original, accurate. We desire to be leaders and servant leaders and people who serve one another in a way that is always faithful. Always faithful. Here's point number two. It's that we will always be responsible. We will always be responsible. The second character trait of a good servant leader is responsibility. It's responsibility. It's being responsible in their personal life, being responsible in their calling, being responsible with the position that has been given to them, being responsible with the task that has been given to them. We value responsibility as leaders, as servants, as people that are serving within the church. And a great definition of the word responsible is simply this, answerable or accountable as for something within one's power, control, or management, it's reliable or dependable. We want to be people that are leading and serving with responsibility in a way that is always being responsible. And here's point number three. We will always be completely trustworthy. We will always be faithful. We will always be responsible. And we will always be completely trustworthy. The third character trait of a good servant leader is being completely trustworthy, being completely trustworthy in their actions, being completely trustworthy to carry out the vision and the mission of our church, being completely trustworthy worthy to love those they serve with, being completely trustworthy in their personal life, and being completely trustworthy in everything they say. And these are not exhaustive lists, but you get the point. We want to be people that are always faithful, always responsible, and always completely trustworthy. And a great definition of being trustworthy is deserving of trust or confidence, dependable and reliable. And when anyone steps into a position of serving or leading at Impact Church, the expectation is for them to always be faithful. It's for them to always be responsible. It's for them to always be completely trustworthy. This is what set Daniel apart whenever they were trying to come against him with things or find things in his life. The reason he was in the position was because of his character and the things that he had put in place in his life. And when they were trying to find something negative about him, all they found was that he was always faithful, he was always responsible, and he was completely trustworthy. And so we want to strive as servants, as leaders, as servant leaders to exhibit the same character traits in our lives. And so will you join us in always being faithful? always being responsible, and always being completely trustworthy as a servant leader.
The last thing that I want to talk to you about today is if you'll look toward the back of the packet that you received when you came in today, there is a, a couple of pages that are titled Serving Opportunities. And these are ways uh, for how you can get involved. And so what we're asking you to do is to take this with you and you will bring it back with you for step two of next steps, but take it with you, pray over these areas, and we're asking you to select three areas uh, that interest you for serving. And so as you look through this and you pray over it, select three of those areas, check those boxes uh, so that we'll know the three areas that you're interested in serving in, the three teams that you're interested in, and we'll be able to go from there. At the bottom of that second page, you'll see a place to print your name so we'll know who this information goes with. And then at the very back of your packet, there's what we call the serve team registration form. And this is where we're going to get personal information from you so that we can be able to set you up in our system uh, for how we schedule people, how we get your information to the team leader uh, over the team that you want to be a part of serving with. And so it's going to help us in that way. And so you'll be able to go through that, fill that out, answer the questions. And then at the very bottom of the last page, you'll see a place where you will sign and date so that we'll be able to know that, hey, you're agreeing to all of these things, uh, that all of your information is correct. It's going to allow us to get you set up. And if you'll bring back with you to step two, if you'll bring back this serve team registration form, and if you'll bring back your three areas of ministry, that you want to be a part of, that you want to serve on these three teams, then we'll be able to get you plugged in in the area that is a best fit for you. And so we thank you in advance for doing that. At this time, your facilitator is going to give you some further instructions and be able to answer any questions that you might have about the things that we have discussed and talked about today. And I want to say thank you so much again for being a part of step one of Next Steps. We hope it's been a blessing to you. We hope it's been informative. And we cannot wait to be on mission with you and to serve with you. God bless you.